We are connected to computer audio. Yay. Okay, and chat. There we go. We are a minute early. I didn't know how long it was going to be to get it in here. And apparently it started recording right away. Recording in progress. So I'm still learning Zoom. It'll take me some time before I'm fully there and aware and able to do it. But in the meantime, you know, I get to learn as I do it, which is always good too. Oh, that's, I guess, where screen share is. Oh, gosh. How can I do? Oh, desktop. Maybe I can just throw this over there and do that. So if you're live, you might be seeing something cool in a minute, but we're going to see. Files. Maybe that would be it. <laughs> we'll, we'll find out. Basic. <laughs> I'll play with this, especially if we can get Rich here um, to see um, how to do this, because I would really like to share. Um, but if not, um, I have them for later for a future one. So what are we talking about today? We're going to get started. Uh, service dog tasks. OK, so service dogs are service dogs because of the tasks that they do to help their person with a disability. So. What tasks do you need for your service dog? And this is one where you're going to talk to people and they're going to have a bunch of tasks and it's going to be very confusing. Uh, so let's define what it is, right? So a service dog, two questions that can be asked is, is that a service dog? And what task or work has the dog been trained to perform, right? So the task or work from the intro is something that will define the dog as a service dog. Now the dog has to be good out in public. You know, he has to have manners, he has to be house potty trained. He can't be, you know, a jerk and barking and, and pooping everywhere and peeing everywhere. But the tasks are huge. And one of the things that happens with somebody with a disability is, you know, you can't do stuff that you want to do. So by doing the, you know, doing the tasks that help the person with a disability out to help you out right makes it easier uh, for you to live and that's the service dog's job right providing comfort making you happy uh making you feel better is not a task so sometimes i'll get that from people whenever they call oh and by the way guys if you are on here live on saturday morning and you have a question or a comment or whatever there is a little chat bar and i do have that open uh, so know that that's there too, but so what do you do? Right. Um, if, if you get a phone call, right, I'm a trainer, I get a phone call, you know, well, I want my dog to be a service dog. Well, what tasks do you need? Um, I want him to like, just make, make me happy and like comfort me because he already does that when we travel. Well, that's an emotional support dog. Um, that's just like there and just makes you happy because he happens to be there. Right. Every dog can be considered. Well, every dog should bring their own joy like that, right? They don't always. And that's sometimes where we get the phone calls, help, my dog's driving me crazy. But that just providing it doesn't cut it. Does that mean that somebody who has a psychiatric a disability cannot have a service dog? No, of course not. Of course they can have a service dog. But the, ta the work that the dog does has to mitigate that disability. And just being there doesn't cut it, right? So, so there's those, there's little things like that that will come up. Uh, I have a giant, I call it my grand task list, my grand master task list um, up on hopeservicedogs.org. I believe I have it on uh, Heart and Soul also, but I haven't updated that site in a while uh, just because, you know, Heart and Soul, I'm not doing too much with right now. Uh, we're just, we're booked out with Hope. Oh, uh, yeah. So if you click on the one from Heart and Soul, it'll take you over to the one at Hope, which makes it a lot easier, too. So 
check out, go to hopeservicedogs.org and under training, about halfway down is the grand task list. And feel free, look at that, print it out, check it off there. I'll put little check boxes there to make it easier for you. Uh, sometimes you'll look at it and you'll say, wait, that's the same thing. It's similar. Like some of them, there's minor differences between them. Uh, some of them, there's bigger differences between them, right? Uh, but we've got the, uh, the, the tasks there, a lot of the tasks there, a lot that we've done, a lot that we've, uh, we've trained over the years, a lot that have been requested over the years. And some of them I like better than others, okay? But here's the thing, guys, it's also what you guys need. It's not what I need. Now, because I've been doing this for close to two decades, I have a little more insight than a lot of other people. And because I've worked with so many people, I've worked with so many owner trainers, I haven't just been doing dysautonomia service dogs for 18 years, right? I've been doing service dogs for all sorts of, of disabilities. I've been working with all sorts of different breeds, um, which will be uh, you know, a whole other how to find the dogs, you know, what, what breeds are great for you, uh, what breeds you want to look at, you know, why I don't do guardian breeds as service dogs, uh, you know, don't think that that would be a, a good one for most people. And herding breeds, I, I don't care for, and I've had two Malinois as service dogs, um, but I don't care for the herding breeds because space can be an issue for them. And, and like I said, there's, so there's breeds I like, golden retrievers, right? Everyone knows that one. Breeds I don't like um, as service dogs, but that doesn't mean that all, you know, like I said, I had two Malinois, I never recommend them. I won't do them again. Um, it's goldens for us from here on out. And then that's going to help with the task. So I'll have people tell me, you know, I want my dog to catch me whenever I fall. So I need to get a Great Dane or a Newfoundland or a Mastiff. And I'm like, no. Uh, catch me when I fall is not a good task, right? So there's strong tasks, there's weak tasks, there's good tasks, there's bad tasks, right? Uh, catch me when I fall is a bad task. Why? Because if you're going to pass out, you do not have the time to even sit down, right? You just, you can just go down, right? If you need a dog to catch you, it's because you do not have the time to pass out or to, to sit down. And if that's the case, does your dog have time to get into position? Can your dog really brace your dead weight? Even if you're, I weigh a hundred pounds soaking wet, I'm just little, so little. I'm just so little and tiny and I'm only a hundred pounds soaking wet. And so I'm gonna get a big old Mastiff Newfoundland Great Dane mix. It's 150 pounds and he'll be able to catch me with no problem, right? No, it's not gonna catch you. Because a hundred pounds of dead weight, boom, like that, you're gonna hurt your dog. You don't wanna hurt your dog, you know? So that's not good. Or I'm in a wheelchair and I need my dog to pull me everywhere. No, get an electric wheelchair. You're going to burn your dog out before your dog even has a chance to get going. And that's not fair to him or to you. Oh, uh, I don't want to use a cane. I'd rather have my dog with me everywhere. So I'm going to train up my dog for mobility. So I don't have to have a cane and I'll just rely on my dog every step of the way. And that's not fair to either of you also. Not only that, but you guys do realize the service dog is going to, for mobility is going to be at least two years and thousands, tens of thousands of dollars. And how much is a cane? Like 20 bucks. And you can even get blinged out bedazzled canes, which would work better, right? And then you could train your dog to go get the cane and bring it to you if you drop it, pick up things that you drop, you know, help brace you to stand up. But, but there's some things I've had people tell me that they, uh, they'll sometimes pass out right? Okay. Like I, I totally get where you're at. They'll sometimes pass out in the woods or away from family and they want the dog to go get help. Well, if you're doing that, you're going to have to have a really well-trained dog. If you're out in the woods somewhere and you pass out, the dog's going to have to know not only how to go and find help, but the old lassie thing, right? How to bring that help back to you and remember where you are. And if your dog runs into a fence, there it goes. You can't do it anymore. So I don't have my dogs. I don't train them to go find Rich. So we have five acres here, a little over. And if Rich is in the back of the property, we have a fence. We call it the dog fence. It goes around the house, right? And that's the dog yard. They go outside and they potty there. So we have a couple doggy doors. 
we have six doors that go outside in my house, which is weird. Like nobody believes me until they come and they count them. Two of those doors, so one third of our doors, have doggy doors in them. So if I want the dogs to go in and out, it's in the storm door and the, the normal door is open. So the dogs can go in and out on their own and then potty on their own and everything else, which is really nice. So I could leave my normal door open and the dog has access to the storm door and has access to the doggy door. And I can have that all the time. And if I pass out, I can have the dog, okay, go get rich, right? Is a task. Well, what happens if he's in the back? What if he goes to the store? And the dog just saw that he went to the store and the dog puts it in his head and he says, I'm going to try to climb the fence to get out, to go follow Rich to get him because mom needs him now. Like I would never put my dog in that situation. And that's where technology comes into play, right? So Apple Watch, Apple Watch, and I'm sure Samsung, I'm, I'm an Apple girl. So Apple Watch has fall alert. So if I fall, if I pass out, it will ding me and it'll say hey it looks like you just took a fall Are you okay if i don't answer to be and it vibrates too it'll be like hey seriously are you okay or do you need me to you know call for help and if i don't answer it'll go through all my emergency contacts including emergency services emergency medical services emts right and give them my exact gps coordinates and it'll also let my family know whoever i have as emergency contact friends and family wise it'll let them know which is pretty cool, right? Like that's going to be much better than my dog trying to go find somebody and bring them back here. Especially what if I'm home alone? It's not going to do a lick of difference. Instead, when I pass out, my dogs are trained to come and stay with me, right? If they don't alert beforehand, I've had some dogs who alert beforehand, some dogs who uh, respond. So there's medical alert response and recovery, right? And we'll get into all this. It'll be, well, we won't get super deep into all of it, but you'll hear about some of it today, right? Medical alert. Some people want it, some people don't. Why would I not want medical alert? Because there's nothing I can do about it. If I'm going to pass out, the only thing I can do about it is get down. And sometimes I'm in a situation where I cannot get down. If I can get down, I will, but sometimes I cannot. So medical alert for that. And, and if I'm sitting there or say you're diabetic and your sugar is running low, what can you do? you can take your sugar and wait as it increases, right? Your glucose, um, if your sugar's high, if your dog is alerting that your sugar's high, it is a waiting game. You can have water, you can exercise to help bring your sugar down. But yeah, okay, I know my sugar's high. Yep, I still know my sugar's high. Yep, I know I'm drinking water, I'm walking around, I'm trying to get that sugar down low again. Thank you, big guy, I appreciate it. So you're gonna get maybe a little frustrated. Your dog's maybe gonna get a little frustrated. So people think right away that they want the alert. And so an alert works really good if there's preventive actions that you can take so bad things don't happen, or if there's um, like emergency meds that you can take. So I talked to people who want a migraine alert dog. This multiple times, I've, I've worked with multiple people for migraine alerts and multiple people who thought they wanted a migraine alert dog. And for migraine alerts, what are you gonna do if the dog alerts that migraine's coming? Is there emergency meds that you can take? And I'm telling you over half the time, the answer is, uh, is well, no, um, I don't really have migraines. I just have really bad headaches, but I call them migraines. Well, that's not going to work. Or they'll tell me I want an epileptic, uh, epileptic alert dog or epilepsy alert dog, right? For that, what are they alerting to? I don't know, right? And, and trainers aren't always going to tell you, I don't know. But they didn't used to know about what the diabetic alert dogs were alerting and then they figured it out right so it's happened before or like this i don't know what they're alerting to it must be cortisol it must be high blood sugar or blood pressure or high pulse rate i don't know what it is that the dog's alerting to um so i'm going to make up a name for it and call it it's a cortisol alert dog and it's probably not a cortisol alert dog because for that you would have to do like double blind studies to see if it's actually a cortisol alert dog or to see if it's actually a high pulse rate, your pulse rate jumps 30 points in 30 seconds, right? Is that now what happens if not? And, uh, you know, if you do it and your dog alerts, oh my gosh, look, my dog alerted to me. See, he's a alert dog for when my pulse bumps up 30 points in 30 seconds. Uh, but then you have to try it without. And what I see a lot on TikTok and I would see it on Insta also is, dog, come here, you know, like, check me. Oh, look, the dog alerted. Well, did he? Because he didn't really do anything 
on his own, you cued him, that's not an alert. Um, I've seen it with food alerts too, with, uh, you know, gluten alert or um, different foods that people can't eat, you know, like dairy alert. Uh, so sometimes people want an excuse to bring their service dog or to bring their dog out and call them a service dog. And you don't need to have an excuse like that. If you have a disability, there's usually multiple things that you can do. So you got the medical alert, right? Medical response is what happens during the medical crisis. So for me, if I'm down, I want my dog to come and be right beside me. I want grounding. Uh, I don't necessarily want DPT at that point because when, personally, when I go down, it looks like a seizure. It's not a seizure. I do not have epilepsy. I do not have uh, misfirings in my brain, right? It is not epilepsy but it looks like it because it is a pretty hard reboot. And when I talk to other people who have dysautonomy and who have been diagnosed with it, they don't always show the same thing. You know, some of them have never passed out. They just get that real wonky feeling. Um, some of them pass out a lot. You know, like it, there's no competition. It's not that I get a service dog because I pass out and it looks like a seizure and you don't get a service dog because you don't pass out like that a lot, like, but I do. So I'm like, better. There, there's none of that, right? And there's not a hundred service dogs that we can place this year. So you must prove to me that you're worthy of a service dog more so than the next person who's going to call me because I want uh, to make sure that I get the service dog, right? No, that there's nothing, nothing like that. Uh, you've got to figure out uh, what it is that you need. Give me one second. Okay, sorry about that. I had to, to talk to Rich for a sec. Okay, so there's no, uh, you're more disabled than I am. So what do you want? And then there's recovery for afterwards. So when I'm coming out of it, for me, it is a hard reboot, right? And it takes some time before I'm fully online. So I want a dog who will do grounding, who will do DPT, who will maybe go get me emergency meds. Now, when does that go into effect? If I'm out in public, there's no emergency meds to get. He might carry it in his pouch, um, in his vest. I might have it in my backpack. You know, so maybe what, teach him to get the backpack off of the back of my wheelchair and give it to me? It, it's not gonna work. Um, he can't, he's not gonna go get help, you know? So there's some things that I like, some things I don't like. Some things I never train. Like I never train turn lights on and off because Alexa makes that a lot easier for us all right now, right? The little computer box person. Uh, there's light switches that'll do it. There's light bulbs that'll do it. And you just hook it up and then you tell her and she turns on and off your light switches and your light bulbs. So I would get that from people who mobility wise or migraine wise, they want the dog to turn the lights off. And I just, you know, I tell them, get, a, get Alexa, make it easier. Again, use the medical stuff to make it easier or the technology stuff to make the medical stuff easier. Uh, I never train really anymore. I don't train, go push the elevator button or go get the um, push the disabled door open button, you know, the clacky clack button. I don't ever train that. And I have one, I have one here um, that we were going to mount on the wall, but looking around and everywhere we go, there is one place that has that button and it's up at Brownwood and that's it. I never see it at Disney. I never see it at Universal. Heck, even Publix has the automatic doors that open and close um, automatically. So most places will have those. Even the bathrooms at Universal, they don't have that. And, and Disney, they don't have that. And they really should at some places. Uh, they don't have it. Instead, they have these little um, S, any Audi places, um, entrances, I guess is an any Audi place. Um, they have these S entrances. So with a wheelchair and a service dog, it's a pain because you've got to go and maneuver through the S, but then they don't have to have the door. So what would I rather have a door or an S? And I'm like, I'd rather have an automatic door. Can we do that? Because doing a door with a wheelchair and a service dog can be a lot, but that's not task-wise. Um, pushing the button. So like, I just, I don't teach them because it's not something that I see a lot. And I do elevators. I don't do stairs, right? I do elevators. Uh, so you could say, well, teach them to push it. Well, they're all a little bit different. And it's just as easy for me to go over and push the button as it would be to send the dog and hope that he hits the right button. He hits the up button, not the down button. And sometimes, you know, usually they're uppy downy, but sometimes they have like an extra button there. We were at the doctor's office yesterday and there was an extra button. I'm like, what the heck is this button for? And I tried pushing it. And well, that wasn't the call the elevator here button. That was just a plastic black cap button. 
Okay. Uh, so the medical stuff, right? Uh, you can do food alerts. So some people like to do that and they need it. They don't just like it. They're not like, oh, look what my dog does. He lets me know if there's corn in here. So I don't eat corn. Like if you have that, the problem is that is one of the harder ones to do is the food in the environment because you have to wean off everything else. Now, I know peanut allergies have gotten a lot worse, you know, for example, than what they were whenever I was a kid. When I was a kid, we bring peanut butter sandwiches to school and I still like peanut butter sandwiches sometimes, you know, peanut butter's good. But what, what could happen, say you have a child who, or say you have a very um, reactive to peanut butter allergy, right? Put you in, in hives and you need your EpiPen and you're gonna die within two minutes if, if you touch peanut butter. You're gonna to want to train that dog to search the environment for peanut butter too. Because what if I'm going into the store and it's a little store and they have a door and I have to open the door and touch it. And the person who came in before me just had a peanut butter sandwich or had a bag of peanuts or something. And there's some peanut residue on that door handle and it's enough to hurt me. Is that happening with a lot of people? I don't know, I'm not in the peanut allergy world, but you know, you need that dog to check the environment and see, you know, playgrounds and kids are gonna be the bigger one instead of like a door of a bookshop that you're walking into. But you know, you do have those. Uh, and sometimes the, most of the time, if you're, if you have allergies like that, uh, you know, if you do go out to eat, I know a lot of people who have them don't go out to eat a lot because they don't trust the person who's, who's cooking it. But, you know, you talk to them and see, but there's a lot of cross-contamination that occurs. Uh, we've done some hotel stays and just looking at it from, uh, you know, uh, we try to go as, I try to go as gluten light as possible. I'd go full gluten free, but that's near on impossible. Um, so I try to stay gluten light which of course my doctor tells me, Vicki, that's not a thing to go gluten. Like you have to go gluten free and it helps. It's just extremely difficult because flour is in everything, like everything, right? There's gluten in everything. And so to go truly gluten free, you have to really cook at home because it'll be, well, yeah, well, it comes like this and there was gluten in it somewhere. So luckily I'm not that bad. I'm not celiac. I'm, I'm good. I can have some gluten in I'm, I'm not going to be really, really, really bad shape because of it. Uh, there's mobility stuff. So with mobility tasks, mobility tasks, you need to, <laughs> you need to wait to put, um, uh, to really get clearance on your dog and to your dogs. I recommend two years. You could try around 18 months and see what your vet has to say. I do recommend going to an orthopedic vet and getting them to okay it. And I've had people who have sent me um, information telling me, you know, here's what my dog's pen hips are. Here's what my dog's OFA scores are. Is my dog good for service work? And I tell them, you need to talk to your veterinarian and have your veterinarian clear it because I can't do that. Uh, you know, they need to do that. They are the, the professional for that. Now, that doesn't mean you wait until the dog's 18 months old to two years old. We'll use two years old because joints are closed usually by then, depending, unless you have like a giant breed dog who won't close fully until he's a little bit older. But again, questions for your vet, not for me. Um, but, but, you know, we have that, right? We start teaching them the foundation skills that are needed when they're super young. So we'll teach them, for example, brace. The foundation skill for that that's needed is a stand. Okay, think about it. Brace is they're gonna stand ideally in front of you, uh, where their body, what is that perpendicular to you, right? Not parallel, perpendicular. And you're going to put your hand on shoulders and potentially on hip and use that to help you stand. Or if they're in their harness, you can use it as a pull up or you can use it as a push down. Pull up is usually easier on the dog, right? Than a push down is, but it's going to be up by their shoulders. It is not their back. It is their shoulders. And that's better than hips just because of, you know, Hip dysplasia is a real big thing in a lot of dog breeds, especially the bigger guys. If you're hitting about 60 or 70 pounds full grown, um, you know, hip dysplasia very well might be something that is an issue in your breed that you want to make sure that you don't exas exasperate that problem, right? 
Um, so brace that we can start training that early, right? We start training the stand and then the stand and perpendicular. And then I'm going to put like two fingers on him. And if he flexes back, I'm going to mark it and reward it. We can start doing that early. Now, I'm not going to put full body weight on the dog. I'm not going to go like, and push off and, and, and do all of that to them, even once they're fully cleared. You know, it's just the minimum I need to help stabilize myself to make getting up easier. If I need a walker to get up comfortably or what I did, I got a lift chair, then that's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to hope that my dog does that for me because it's not, it's not fair to them um, at all. I don't, I don't want to do that. So we have that, right? And then we uh guide me out is one right or forward momentum pull is similar or counterbalance can be similar too and that's where harnesses and gear can start being taught super early when you're in a harness it is okay to pull and i want you to pull and how much you pull depends on how much you mark and reward that behavior whenever you are on your normal collar or you don't feel tension on the harness don't pull. But when there's tension on the harness, pull. So the dogs can be taught the differences in that young, even though you're not like, pull me, how many dogs pull their owners all over the block, right? Whenever they're young. So you can start teaching that stuff early. And then once you get clearance, you're good to go. Uh, hearing alert stuff. So uh, if somebody has hearing aids, or if somebody doesn't hear very well, or maybe gets uh, it doesn't respond, you know, like you can call my name a few times and it takes me a while to respond because I don't always hear that. You might want to train your dog to, to alert and let you know. Uh, when your phone rings, when a baby cries, when an alarm goes off, when somebody knocks at your door, you know, you can do those. So there's one-way alerts and there's two-way alerts. So one-way alert is you'll just come and get me and let me know, oh, okay, yeah, the timer just went off, thank you. Or there's two-way alerts, come and get me, take me to the front door because there's somebody at the front door. I don't do a lot. We've done some hearing alerts. Hearing alerts aren't that bad. Um, they're not that difficult. I don't mind doing them. Um, it is the repetitions. All training is repetitions, So that's not a big deal. Um, guide stuff, I don't do. So I've had people who've called me up because they want uh, like a seeing eye dog, a guide dog type of thing. I don't do that, but I have done like, help me get out of here. Um, guide me to the exit, guide me to the car, you know, follow this person. That stuff is a lot easier um, than like, make sure you don't hit your head on branches and make sure you stop. And now you are a, 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 a seeing eye dog, you know, a guide dog for somebody with a visual disability. I don't do those. And I've had people who ask, who will ask if I cross train uh, because they have visual impairments and they also have physical needs. And some of the guide dog places will only do one will only do that and they won't do the other. So some people, you know, I was talking to a woman yesterday and she has three different disabilities that she would like help with. And I said, it might become, it might come down to a, what is more important to you? Is it more important to have the big dog who could do mobility to have, let me see if I remember correctly, the dog who will do the scent alerts that you needed or the dog who will do the sight alerts that are needed because there's two different things going on there. And that's when people tell me I need uh, a seizure alert dog. We get into the whole, tell me about your seizures. Tell me about what it is that you need. Is it like a, a chemical thing? Have you talked to your doctor about it? Is it a hormonal thing um, that you're having seizures? You know, what's going on? Is it due to the misfiring in your brain? Or is it due to, I had a panic attack that escalated and it ended up having a seizure? Because guess what, guys? They're trained two totally different ways. Or at least I train them two totally different ways. One is trained via scent, which means we need to get the sample during, which can be hard to do because a lot of people are on meds that take care of it for the most part. And then when they want to service dog, they think they do anyway because, you know, it'd be cool to bring your dog with you everywhere until so they get it. And they're like, crap, this is a lot of work. Mm-hmm. If meds are working for you, go for the meds, you know, just make it easier on yourself um, versus psychiatric um, interruptions are often visual. So I want to talk who has a strong focus on people, that strong um, pack drive type of thing, right? And so we'll work them with a lot of focus. Pay attention to me, look at me. This is what I want you to do if this happens. So 
psychiatric, I like doing those. It's, it's nice because it's, it's an easier one, right? You don't have to do all the scent repetitions. Uh, but say somebody scratches real bad, scratches their arm real bad and, you know, like it'll bleed or whatever, right? Or even not that bad. They just scratch their arm really bad. And, and that's their trigger, right? That leads to that and then panic attack comes, right? And, and then they have a seizure. Like, we'll just combine everything here. So what we do is we teach the dog that this means something. The scratching of the arm means something. And that's the first indication. So in order to get that, what's the foundational skill that's needed is focus is just to look at you. Um, so here I have a question. Um, Anne asks, how can you teach your dog to bring you a bottle of water, but only when necessary? I think we'll bring me water bottles all the time, all day long. I have pots with low blood pressure and low blood volume. You know, Anne, I think that is a great question. So I did not, so I've, I've had, I got diagnosed with um, neurocardiogenic syncope when I was 19. I've been passing out since my single digits. I'm in my forties now, unless I talk to my husband, in which case I tell him I still feel like I'm like mid twenties. Uh, I didn't realize that it was a low blood volume thing also. Like low blood pressure usually, right? And then pulse skyrockets because he has me off of my heart rate ones. Um, so I think it was up to like 160 while I was in the car yesterday. You know, we were, um, I went with my parents to a doctor's appointment. I was like, really? Seriously? Like 160 for sitting in the car here. Okay. Um, but I didn't realize about the blood volume thing. So yeah, I've got my trusty body armor right here beside me. Um, so how do you do that? You've got a couple different options. And again, I'm gonna give you, give you a few options because there's not one right answer for everybody. One of the things you can do is say, I just need a bottle of water or body armor or liquid IV or whatever, right? I just need that or salt pills. So I'm gonna to put together, uh, and I actually have one. I don't have it with me, it's in the bathroom because I need to work on training the new dogs with it, but I don't want it to become a toy. But I will get a travel kit, like a men's shave travel kit at Walmart is a good place to get them. Um, I will get one of those and in it is a body armor, a liquid IV, salt tabs, and my meds. So if I need something, I can just send the dog, go get my med kit go my med pouch, go my med bag, whatever you want to call it. And they go and get it. Now that doesn't mean, like make it easy on your dog. I was watching somebody on TikTok and they were teaching the dog to go into the bathroom, open up the cupboard door, get the med bag out, shut the cupboard door and come to the person. It's a lot of work. Like just leave it on the bookcase, leave it on the nightstand, leave it on an end table and, and just have the dog go and get it. Cause I don't always hang out at this one spot. What if I'm in another spot and I need it, right? I'm usually in this spot, but still, what if I'm the other? So like, I want them to go and get it. I want them to know where it is. I want to make sure that it's stocked up at all times. So that's where like, okay, maybe I check it every day, make sure that everything's there that I might need for the day. And then guess what happens? Like right now I have an ear infection starting and I have eardrops. So I could put the eardrops in there and then the dog can get me those. I don't have to teach the dog, no, no, go find me the eardrops. Um, and if I have a headache, I can put maybe one of those little baby <laughs> bottles of Tylenol in there not baby Tylenol, but like, I like the little bottles. I'll keep those. So, so we'll have them that have expired like five and 10 years ago. And, and Luke, who's the king of expiration dates, will be like, mom, these are bad. These expired like 10 years ago. And I'm like, no, honey, that's just the bottle. Like the pills inside are still good. So I like the little bottles. Plus it's um, those little clamshell pill containers are a lot easier to open than the bottles are. Those are a lot harder to open. So you could do that. And then you get people who like, I do like chilled water. And do like, you know, chilled more than room temperature, but beggars can't be choosers either. So that was option one is the med bag. Option two is to tea, to have a little baby fridge because they have the little fridges now that, that are like hold six cans of soda pop, right? And, and it'll be like, oh, look at this. And, and you'll see on TikTok, they have the little organization things because they have it for like the kid's room. And it's super cute. Well, what if this is my chair that I'm in most of the time? And I just get one of those little fridges that, like the size of a six pack, right? Or little makeup fridges. And I just keep that beside me and I keep that stocked with a few of them. I'm good then, right? So that's gonna be an option for you. Third option for you is to, and that your dog doesn't have to open, right? Cause it's right there for you. But what if you're in another room? Well, that might be where the med bag comes in. Um, third option is gonna be to get a, um, what is it? A little like apartment fridge, not apartment fridge, like dorm fridge 
like the little ones that are like three cubic feet and they like come up to your knee and teach the door to open and close that. Now, the thing with that is if you think you're going to need it, right? And this is a trick somebody told me and I loved it. And so I stole it and ran with it is you do a fleecy rope with a clip on it and you clip it to the inside uh, to one of the shelf things like on the, on the door. Cause a lot of them will have the, like where the, you put the soda cans in and they just pop out at the bottom because they're little, right? So you put that in there. So if you're, if you think you're going to need it, your dog can easily open up by pulling that tug. But if you're going to go for the day, you can take it off or you can tuck it inside there. So your dog doesn't have access to it. And depending on how, how thick you do it and how you design up your fleecy tug, you know, you want it skinny where it goes through the seal of the fridge, but then your dog doesn't have access to it without you there. Because I think that was number, what that was that number three, I think. Number four option is going to be your real fridge. And the problem with that is I've had dogs, like Arrow and Django would have had so much fun with that task. And we would have come home and the whole fridge would have been emptied out and they would have been so proud of themselves, right? So I don't want my dog to know how to open my fridge. Plus I have a full-size fridge and I have a full-size freezer. Right. So it's um, like restaurant type because I've got a huge kitchen and um, we have cows. Well, we had cows. And so we have a, like a, a full cow can fit in my freezer once it's been to the butcher. But I don't want them to be able to open it. And it's very it can be hard for me to open, let alone for them to open. So I, I, I haven't taught them that. Um, instead, I got to get rich and look to bring me drinks. But the the other options, you know, the med bag, the baby fridge the dorm fridge to me are gonna happen before I train on a full size fridge. Um, but you know, and for that, what do you need foundation skills? You need a retrieve, a uh, carry to you, which is play-based. Uh, you need a tug, which is also play-based. And then you'll need a touch, which is um, either paw or nose touch bump to close the door afterwards. But that was a great question, Anne. I, I appreciate that. Uh, let's see here. So we have medical alert, mobility dogs we've discussed, uh, psychiatric service dogs, uh, and then the dysautonomia. And then, like I said, there's the hearing and there's um, the visual. And there's others too. If you guys think of any that I, I haven't hit on, let me know. Um, but there, there's a bunch. And you can go on that grand task list on hopeservicedogs.org and see what they are. And there's some we don't do. What are some that I don't train? And even some that I used to train because I was going through our online course and I thought, holy smoke, some of those videos on there, I'm like, I, I don't recommend this. I'm not having this on here. Um, I don't teach a center position. I know that was one I had on there that we removed because with this autonomia, with mobility, that's going to knock you over on your bum and you don't want that to happen. And if you're in a wheelchair, center is not going to be available much either. Uh, for my electric chair because I've got the stuff there and for my manual chair because that's where my smart drive goes. So center was removed. Um, I don't usually teach a jump alert. I don't like a jump alert. I don't want the dog jumping up on me because again, I get dizzy wonky and I can get knocked over, but Clara has a jump alert. It worked out really good for her. Like she took to it very well, which often they do. She only does it in specific situations. And if she needs to give the alert, you know, and they're standing in the middle of the store. It's a great way to do it. You can't just do a block alert. You can't always do like a nose bump or whatever else, but she took to it as something we can always change up in the future. But by and large, I don't do jump alerts, especially for dysautonomia. I don't like it. Um, what other ones? I know there's a few others that I don't like. And ones that I do like. Oh, find help. Yeah, I don't like find help. Why don't I like find help? Well, first I was telling you what happens if if the if the person's away, uh, you know, out of the area. The other thing is I don't want my dog going up to some rando in a store and hoping that the rando can help with whatever medical situation's going on. Like he's a rando, he's probably not a qualified medical professional. He doesn't know what the heck I'm go what is going on. Um, and, and it's just, it's not a good one. You know, the dog can be stolen. Look, this dog just wandered up to me. Now he's mine. Uh, you could be robbed. Oh, look, here's a person, a wallet. I'm going to take it and go. Um, I mean, honestly, 
you could be abducted because, oh no, it's my wife, my girlfriend, my sister, my friend. I'm just going to get her out of here right now. And even if you're really wonky, you know, it, it's not good, right? So don't teach your dog to go off and bring you strangers. Like the stranger's not going to know what to do with it. And then you hear, well, there's something called a bring cell and dogs, search and rescue dogs will use them. And what will happen is search and, and trust me, this comes back to it. They will go out and if they find what they were looking for, right? There's a little tab on their collar and they'll put it in their mouth and they'll go back to the owner, handler slash owner slash handler. And the owner handler knows that that means that they found what they were looking for and will follow the dog to find it. Okay. That is used in a very special situation with the owner who has trained that as a response. That is not expecting the general public to know that when a dog comes up to you with something in his mouth, that means come with me to my owner. And holy smokes, do I see this a lot. I'll see it, you know, there'll be waves of it and it'll go up around TikTok and it'll go up on Instagram and up on Facebook. And, you know, like if a dog, if a service dog just comes up to you randomly at the store, follow him because that means that his owner in danger and he needs your help. He doesn't need my help. Again, Apple Watch will let emergency medical personnel who are actually qualified to deal with it know exactly where I am down to the GPS coordinates. It doesn't say I'm at Walmart somewhere. It says this is exactly where you're at, right? Um, and that's who I want to deal with it. Why? Because in Rich was, um, one of his jobs that he was at, they needed people to, to be part of the emergency medical team in case there was an issue that they could um, first responder type of thing, but it was at work and it wasn't anything like official. He didn't get a raise or anything for it. He just thought it'd be neat. And so he did it. One of the things he learned is again, it's all going to come back. I go off on tangents, but I'll eventually work my way back. Um, is you have to tell somebody you right there, you call 911. Because if you just say somebody call 911, everyone's going to assume somebody else did it. So you need to pinpoint one person and say, you call 911. So this whole, well, I'm going to take the dog um, or a dog comes up to you, follow them. It's never going to work, guys. Never going to work. Don't do it. It's just setting yourself and your dog up for danger. What should you do instead? Apple Watch and teach your dog to stay with you during a medical episode. Just, just stay right there beside you. I was at the grocery store couple of weeks ago and I didn't have a dog with me. I didn't have the wheelchair with me. I have my parents with me. They moved down here now, right? So they've been here for um, about six weeks now, I think. And so we'll go shopping and stuff together. It's been, gosh, they just had their 50th wedding anniversary yesterday. Rich and I have our 25th wedding anniversary, the end of the year. So they moved away from uh, Wisconsin where we're all living at the time. Right before, Four, I think right before Rich and I had our one year anniversary. So we haven't lived in the same town permanently for 24 years. So like it is fun to go shopping with them, right? Um, so, so we went to the store and I wasn't feeling good. So I said, I'm going to sit down here. You guys go and get what we needed. You know, they had a list that we, we like our lists. I said, you guys go and get what's needed. I'm, I'm just going to sit here. I didn't have the dog with me either. Albert was at home and I was sitting there. I wasn't feeling good. So I just laid down. Now, usually I try to find an aisle that people aren't, but this was, it was a grocery store and it was by the peanut butter and the bread. So of course, everybody's using that aisle and going down that aisle. I had no less than a half a dozen people stopping and talking to me. Are you okay? Which is fantastic. And I love that people are that, you know, um, helpful, right? Like I'm not, I'm not complaining about that at all. Are you okay? I'm, I'm fine. Well, I, I don't want to leave you here. Don't just, just leave me here. I'm fine. But like, can I, can I get somebody for you? Like, I, I can't leave you here. I'm like, yes, you can't just, just please leave me here. Like this happens to me all the time. Um, and if I would have had my wheelchair and I could have put my legs up on the wheelchair, I think people would have understood that I had it manage. Um, and if I would have had my service dog there and my service dog was in a sit, stay or down, stay right next to me, they would have understood that I had it manage. But the fact that it was me alone, it was not manage, right? And, and it was difficult. You know, and so somebody uh, finally, they, somebody said, you know, like, I'm going to get you a wheelchair. And I'm like, no, no, like, I just, I just need some time. Like, I just need to reboot here. Um, and it wasn't a full on even thrashing one. So I thought, you know, thank goodness y'all didn't see that. But someone went and got me one of the store chairs, which I've never used. I've just brought my own chair in. I tell you, the store chairs go a lot slower. 
but it is really nice to have that basket on the front. Um, so brought me a store chair and was like, like, get up in it. You're like good to go now. I'm like, but I can't sit up yet. Like I'm still, so after a couple of minutes, I was able to sit up and then a couple more minutes, I was able to get into it. And then I could, you know, whiz off. But while I appreciate it, the stay with me during to me, in my experience, is going to be a much more desired task than to go get help from rando weirdos, right? Jump alert, I don't like. Catch fall, we don't like. We discussed that. Um, the other one I don't like, and I've seen y'all have seen the video, right? The under the head when you're having an episode. So the person's like slamming the head back onto the floor and the dog comes and, and goes, there. you do realize that a human head weighs about, what is it, eight to 10 pounds? It's about the same as a bowling ball and you're slamming it into the dog repeatedly. Like, it's not good. Like, I wouldn't recommend teaching that to your dog. Um, I would, if you wanted to do it, if it's something like, no, you don't understand. When I have these seizures and I slam my head, I could get a concussion. And so I'd rather not get a concussion and hurt my dog than to get a concussion and not hurt my dog. And it might be that, you know, wear a helmet to protect your head. Well, no, because then I feel funny. I don't care if this is something that you're going to get a concussion. If you do, like, let's use tools. Let's use mobility aids. Let's use medical aids. Let's use aids that will keep you safe. You think I like going around in a wheelchair? And I'm like, well, hey, look at me, guys. I'm like special and stuff. No, but I tell you, it helps a lot. Uh, especially when I wear my compression hose and my compression sleeves. And like, I feel ridiculous sometimes, but I don't care. And this is one thing, thank goodness my parents taught me whenever I was younger, right? It doesn't matter what other people think of you. It matters how you think of yourself. So if it's something that you need, do it. And, and, and who cares? Um, which, you know, was, was much appreciated. That's a big gift that they did give me. And I, I greatly appreciate it. But I don't like that. Um, I would rather have the dog, you know, do that grounding lay beside me. So we'll practice that. So how do you train that? You have to practice it. So for us, because of where we live, we're outside the villages, which is a big retirement area. And Walmart is close. So I do a lot of stuff there, right? And you'll see that in the videos up on TikTok and all. Uh, baby area is usually like one of the least busy places. So I'll do a lot of training in the baby area. So if you see that in the TikToks and you're like, why is she always in the baby area? It's because it's the like least used part of my Walmart. So it works out really well because nobody's in it. Um, I like it. it. It's really nice that way. But you'll find what works for you and in your area. But we'll go there and we'll work on, we'll work at the house here first, right? And we'll work maybe up at Brownwood, which is one of the village centers. Um, we'll work out in public, but we'll work on, I'm sitting on the ground and the dog comes up to me. I'm lying down on the ground. This is what I want the dog to do. And then I'll have Rich there that if I'm lying on the dog on the ground, what I want the dog to do. So I have a friend uh, and we were practicing this with her dog. So she's a trainer also, but she hadn't been diagnosed with uh, dysautonomia yet. And she was calling it a blackout response. And I believe it's in one of the TikToks. I think I still have it up there, but it's, it's way a long time ago, like over a year ago and uh, probably closer to two years ago. But she was calling it a blackout response. And so we were working, we had her down, you know, sitting on the ground and then, you know, like fell, laid down, easy, don't, don't hurt yourself. And then Rich came up with her dog and, you know, we were trying to show the dog what we wanted. So then if the dog would find her in this position, what we wanted the dog to do, which was lay down beside with the body up against, their body up against your body, um, or possibly get into DPT or possibly get underneath your legs to raise them up to get the blood flow. So like there's different things depending on what your needs are, what your dog would be good at and the size of your dog too, because if you have a Pomeranian, you're not teaching the Pomeranian to get underneath your legs to raise them. It's not going to happen. Um, so, so we're doing that and, uh, you know, it, it's neat to be able to put those pieces together. And a lot of the time when we do training, we do it in chunks. So, you know, like this is part of it, this is a part of it, this is a part of it. And then we can put it all together. Okay. Uh, then she got, she was listening. She was at one of our, our schools and listened to us talking about dysautonomia. And she says, I think I have that. And I said, oh, honey, I know you have that. I diagnose a lot of people as a dog trainer. Um, and I tell them I'm not medical professional at all. I've never been in the medical field at all. Um, but I said, yeah, I, I thought you knew that you, um, you had that. So she actually went and she got diagnosed. So I thought that was pretty neat that, you know, now she's able to get the help that she needs 
for it. Um, and I thought that she just wanted to call it blackout response because she liked the name of it, not because she didn't realize what was happening. Um, is it difficult? Another question came in. Is it difficult to teach the dog to get into a backpack? I have one with a seat and the med bag would be inside or the water bottle. Do you, I assume you need to get a backpack with a seat and the med pack would be inside or the water bottle in the front pouch. Um, it all depends on the size of your dog. So even little tiny dogs, even like little 10 pound chihuahuas, Pomeranians, if it's not too big of a pouch, they could probably get it. Now, you can't get the chihuahua or Pomeranian dog to pick up this, I think this is a 16 ounce bottle of, um, yes it is, a body armor. Like they can't pick this up easy, golden retriever, okay. Um, a golden can, a full grown golden can pick this up with no problem. Uh, so you want to watch that too. Now we've trained, I remember one dog that we trained, they wanted it to pick up pens and pencils and silverware because the woman would drop these because they're smaller, but she wouldn't drop bigger things. So, you know, they just needed little things picked up, but we also have to look at the future. I remember last time, uh, whenever we did one of these, it was as a service dog right for you. And it was, you have to look into the future too. You can't say, ah, we're good. Um, this is what I need today. We want to look to see what we might need in the future. Um, and, and so for that, you know, that, that's not my favorite to do at all. Um, so yeah, you, you teach them to get the ba the backpack, uh, depending on the size, depending on how heavy it is, just like kids in middle school and high school now, and they have like the really heavy backpacks because all their textbooks have to fit in it. Cause they don't have time to go to the lockers. Like your dog's not gonna be able to drag that. And if you want it, and if you're like, Hey, no, I don't care. He can drag that to me. You know, you can do that. What I would recommend doing is looking up some YouTubes, or um, if you're in one of the Facebook groups, ask Andrea uh, Smith. She's Koji's owner, um, the princess one, right? Um, she got braided me up a really nice fleece tug. And what it is, is fleece with a leash clip at the end of it. You can use a carabiner, but a leash clip is gonna last longer. Uh, and so I can clip that onto things. So what did I do? I have my kitchen we have for the trash is in a pool cabinet. It's the only pool cabinet I have. And I keep one of these, a fleecy braid thing. You can also just take it and just braid a braid. If you can take three or four strands and make it into a braid, do that. Uh, like what you do with your hair, right? And then knot it at the end. And there you go, you have a, a tug. And so I'll do it there. And so we can work if we want to on teaching the dogs to open and close the garbage. Why do I need it for my disability? No, but you know, like they can pull it open. Uh, and, and then I can throw stuff away. Or if I'm gonna work on tug, I've got that set up there. So depending on how long you want it, but you can definitely, I, I wouldn't teach them to pull the zipper, but if you have like a little zipper extension, or if you get one of these clips, cause you can get any leash clip you want. You can get any fleece, any color, any size, any length that you want. I mean, heck you could probably do cotton. I just like fleece. And usually you can find it really cheap. Uh, Walmart, Joanne Fabric, any fabric type place. They'll sometimes have like the remnants of fleece so like it doesn't have to match it could just be whatever you find or if you have like an old blanket an old fleece blanket type of thing you can just strip that up and use that um which is pretty cool right Th that you have those options and how i like to start any of that type of stuff any of that retrieve would be an empty backpack right and you know play fetch play fetch play fetch oops drop it does what's your dog do uh, and then as that's doing good, I'm going to take a couple empty water bottles or body armor. I like the body armor ones because they're a little bit sturdier than the water bottles. Like this is a good bottle. Like it's a good bottle for training. The dog's not going to puncture it as easily. Um, and I'm going to use them when they're empty, right? And if I want to fill them so they can see what it is like with stuff in it, I can either fill them up with water after I use them or I can um, use a, a real one right? Like it, it won't matter as much, but then you're going to start doing it with some stuff in there uh, and teach the dog and show them, you know, like what it is you want them to pull, um, what it is you want them to grab. Is it going to be one of the pool, one of the clip things, um, fleecy braids that you clip onto it? Is it going to be pick up by the handles and bring it to me? Is it just going to be pick it up somehow and bring it to me? And they'll find out what's more comfortable for them. Uh, you know, you've got a lot of options, which is really nice. Uh, what I do and this is for you too, is I will take a body armor if I'm really feeling bad and I will put a um, either a liquid IV or an LMNT, the LMNT no flavor one, 
super awesome um, because it's going to up your salt. But I will, I will do that. Um, you do have to take a swig or two out of the body armor first before you add in the packet of electrolytes, um, just so there's room to shake it up. Uh, and then possibly even do a salt tab or the salt chews. Uh, and there's one vitassium, I want to say, is marketed specifically for dysautonomia. So they're the chews and you're supposed to put it in your mouth and kind of let it dissolve. So I'll do those too. So if I'm really doing bad, I will really work on upping my salt, which usually means then, you know, I want something sweet, which is nice because the body armor, I love body armor. Um, and really the body armor and the liquid IV are about the same in cost. You know, it's about a buck for a body armor. It's about a buck for a liquid IV. So when you combine them, yeah, it's $2, but usually I'll feel better faster than if I just do one or the other. <clears throat> now you heard me talking about uh, foundation, foundation skills for surface work. And I know we're closing in on an hour. So if y'all have any questions, let me know. I'll give you a, while I'm talking about this. So I have some ideas here. I do want to talk about service dogs, breeds, and breeders, what to look for, where to find them, what questions you should be asking, what red flags are, all of that. I want to talk about service dog gear. I'm actually, if you look up, I just put up uh, pictures of Albert from yesterday. Well, I put him up yesterday um, and video. So TikTok, Insta, and Facebook will have it up on the Hope stuff. Uh, we, we do, I like raspberry field for my vests and we we're talking with them. We're in the works on creating a Y front for it because the strap that goes across, we don't like, I don't like, I have videos of dog of the dogs walking in those and it hinders their gait, hobbles their gait too much. I don't want to use those. So I'd like to do a Y front. And if that doesn't work, I think we're going to have to move to fleece harnesses that are embroidered with service dogger and training on it which again, I would prefer not using um, because I like the pockets and the embroidery and I love having the logo on it, but I want what's best for the dog. So, uh, so we're doing that and looking. So gear, I wanna discuss at some point gear, gear for hot weather, I'm an expert on. Gear for cold weather, I have had my dogs up north while it's been cooler, um, you know, so we can definitely discuss that stuff. Um, and then foundation skills. So as, as I was talking today, I talk about, you know, the, the brace, what the foundation skill is, which is a touch and a stand and then a flex back. So what we do during our service dog schools is we'll go through the tasks and we'll write on the whiteboard what the foundation skill is for each of those tasks. So that will be a whole one of these webinars on your own. And if you don't understand how to train tasks, this is going to be perfect for you. Because when we hit that and you see what is needed, it is only every time we do it. And then I add extra things in, like I'll add in the manners minder because I like that for the puppies. I don't always do it, but I do like it for the puppies. Um, we'll add in sit down, come play, stay heel. Well, that's like six of them right there. And it turns out it's only about 20 foundation skills that are needed to teach all these different tasks, okay? And it might be the next one that we talk about that because like I said, I do like, that's one of my favorite things to discuss um, is those foundation skills that are needed because you need to know these things, right? And that is apparently one of my superpowers. Luke has a super sniffer, my son, he can smell. So if we think like, is this turned? Like Luke, smell this. Um, and he'll he'll notice things before we do because he can smell them. Um, my mom apparently has the same thing, which I didn't know about. She just told me about that a couple of days ago. But she has a super sniffer. Um, so that's their superpowers, right? Mine is I can break down. If you want a task, I might have to think about it for a little bit, but I can break that down into chunks so we can get that trained. I mean, I do that a lot for people, which is why I've got my grand task list, right? So I want your homework to, is going to be to check out the grand task list and see what's all there. If your task that you're interested in or that you've done or that you like a lot is not in there, please message me. Um, you can email me at victoria at hopeservicedogs.org. Uh, you can text me. Uh, you can reach me through social media outlets. Uh, our website is, it's a link tree because it's just easier. So it's L-I-N-K link T-R dot E-E. So link tree with the dot ee there, right? Link tr dot ee um, slash backslash hope sd. So h o p e 
S for service, D for dog. Link trees, hope SD. Uh, so that will have all the stuff on there, right? It'll have our contact info, email, all our social media. Uh, whenever we schedule these, I put a link up there for people to register and you do have to register for each one. Um, if you wanna be here on the live call and get your questions answered and addressed and dealt with, which works out really good. Um, but we need, I can't train all the service dogs guys. I don't wanna train all the service dogs, especially now that we're breeding that takes up a lot of what we can do. Um, but what I can do is help and instruct and get a nice network of people who can do all of it. Um, we're also talking, one of the things that happened in the last couple of weeks, um, since my last one, I think my last one was a week ago, but we had uh, the contractor came out um, and we discussed, I think it was like over a week ago, but still, we discussed putting in our secondary building. Once the secondary building goes in, which he said it'd be 90 days and we still have to talk to him and say, let's do this. Um, but then we'll be able to schedule up a service dog school. So, and we'll have a building, so it won't matter what the weather is outside and we won't be in the carport, we'll be in a building. So I'm excited for that, that should be good. But otherwise, um, this, what did I do with it last week? It went up on YouTube and it went into our podcast. So our podcast is back. So if you're finding this through the podcast, know that it, it's also live uh, and it's currently Saturdays, but we might be playing with the time. I just, I prefer mornings and I figure Saturday morning works. Um, and this worked out really good starting at 11 um, Eastern. So if you have any ideas, any thoughts, any help, any suggestions, any tips, let me know. Otherwise, have a fantastic weekend and I will catch you next time.